I have a fear of foam heads. Uh, yeah, the ones at the arts and crafts section of Walmart. And I do avoid that section out of fear of the foam head being there. I wasn't always scared of foam heads. The um, fear started because of an experience. Um, it, it was a supernatural encounter. And it began in the spring of 2020 in my choir class. It was the second period of the day, chamber choir, bunch of ninth graders. In, the, in his office, in his office, we, um, me and a group of friends had convened and were hanging out. And eventually we had an idea to make our own Ouija board. And uh, we made it out of some paper and scrawled the alphabet. The top of a water bottle we combined our hands and and then, and then uh, when we asked the the spirit what its name was, we got a whole bunch of random letters E B E did a circle and it um, spelled out the name Abebenab resembled Abebenab and uh, that kind of became a joke. We we made it a a big thing how. We summoned a ghost named Abendmet. And that was a name that we didn't know it then, but it would come to haunt us for years to come. My name's Gavin Richardson. My name is Brexton Besant. And I helped give a spirit a body. And then uh, that night, uh, Brex and I were hanging out and we decided to go to Walmart. And we saw in one of the aisles, this white styrofoam head. And we were like, you know what? That would make a great movie prop. You know those scenes where they like have people falling down off of cliffs and whatnot? This could make a really good dummy. So we bought it and we went to my house and proceeded to make a dummy with this styrofoam head that we purchased for five bucks. We imbued this, this horrific, but strangely humanoid figure uh, with the spirit of Benamed that we made. And we were quite proud of our creation. I mean, it, it was impressive. Uh, took a lot of work too. <laughs> and then we decided that we were a little bit freaked out by what we'd made. So we destroyed the thing, absolutely killed it. But we gave the, the camera to his little sister and we said, we hit record and we said, okay, now you wait here and we're gonna run upstairs um, and we are gonna look over the balcony and we're gonna throw this dummy over the edge. Um, and Kevin's little sister, shakiest camera and we could hardly see it fall in the footage, but it was there. And uh, we threw it over the edge and that's, I think, when the craziness set in, when the uh, rage, when this anger towards this dummy, we let out. That's kind of when it started. Um, the body with a lack of bones twisted and turned unnaturally through the air. Uh, his pale head infinitely staring as it turned around its chassis. Then it um, swatted the ground almost silently because it was made of pillows. Uh, and um, after that, we, we got carried away. We dismembered it, dragged on pavements, threw it off of countless high places, drowned in a hot tub, Stabbed it. Stabbed, vandalized. Shot it with arrows. Thrown and by the end of the night, utterly mutilated. Once we'd done all the damage we could to the lower parts of the bodies, we took the head. Took uh, the head to the mountains for our final act. The mountains were cold and dark and the uh, lengthy yellow grass had stuck to our socks. 
with only phone flashlights to illuminate our surroundings, uh, we intended to leave a bevan of his head in the scenery. Um, a piece of his jaw fell off uh, on the ground. It, it, it looked like a giant smile had been etched into this white face, um, almost like it was laughing at us after everything it had been through with its markers and harpoon and anything else that was stuck into it. Um, and then we left him there in the mountains for a later time. Until probably a couple days later, uh, we realized leaving styrofoam in the mountains probably wasn't a good idea. So we, um, we went up to go retrieve this, uh, retrieve the head. And we went up, it was, it was warmer this time, and the reds and the yellows were a lot easier to see on the ground, but one color was missing, uh, white. The, the head was gone, it, it was disappeared, it was missing. The head was not where we had left it. So we started thinking what could have happened to this head, could, well, the, could someone have picked it up? Could uh, the wind have blown it away? And that's when we saw the piece of jaw. The head that we mounted was completely gone, except for the jaw the piece of the jaw that we ripped off. And if someone had come up and picked it up, uh, why didn't they pick up that piece of jaw too? Since that point, there was this looming feeling that he wasn't gone. We hadn't gotten rid of him. And it, like parts of his so-called personality started manifesting themselves in little things like uh, the demon lights on the street the lights in our neighborhood would go out. They uh, they would mysteriously turn off whenever we got close. We would see them on, and when we got close, they would turn off. And once we had passed, the eerie the orange glow would turn back on again. And we definitely felt like it was somebody deliberately doing that. It wasn't just coincidence. And it felt like a Abedinev was waiting for its revenge or that it was trying to communicate. And then eventually it, it did. One day uh, I was going about my business, doing my things and almost out of the blue, Breck sent me a voice recording about a dream that he'd had the previous night. I, I listened to it and it was actually really scary. I got secondhand fear. I was walking up my, my street on my way up to Gavin Richardson's home. Looking at my feet, I was trudging along, and then uh, I, I, I got, I, I stopped. There was an obstacle in my way. It was socks, lumpy striped socks. And I stopped and I slowly looked up, and my eyes revealed to me black jeans, a leather belt, a green hoodie, and a red claw, and then finally a white foam head. This was a Bebenev, and he was watching me. He was looking at me, and he stood three feet over me, and he watched. Just kind of standing there, not moving, and so he wasn't f super freaked out by it. Rushes of thoughts and doubts ran through my head, trying to give me some self-assurance. I, I thought, he's not real. He can't touch me. He's inanimate, he can't move. He lifted up his gloved hands. And the fear was so tense and in such a spike that I immediately woke up from my dream. And I was so grateful that it was a dream, but I, uh, I remember specific things, which was I was facing away from my door. Uh, you know, when you're laying down and you're away from your door, and when you have that scary thought, you're afraid to turn around. I've never been more afraid to turn around and look at that door. He told me that that gave the impression that he was really alive. He was he was there. He was this big, imposing figure that had life imbued into it, and life that was not exactly friendly. After about six months of the initial creation, S several months. Yeah, it had to have been several months after we initially made a Bemmed. Me and Gavin 
decided to try and make amends. And being haunted by him for that whole time, we just, Brex and I decided that it was, it was time that we do something about it, that we try to resolve this issue with this spirit that we had pissed off. And we felt that we needed to make peace with Abebeneb and also ourselves. And we went to Walmart and we bought another head. We went to the store again, uh, went to that dreaded aisle and purchased another head. And we built him again, exactly the same, but with a couple of structural upgrades, I guess, to make him more stable. Uh, we created the body, everything was the same. After a little while of keeping him in my basement, Brex and I were hanging out with a couple of our friends who didn't believe in a Abemnameb. And we told them to leave the room for a little bit. Our friends giggled at us through the, through the window as me and Gavin stood over this nine foot tall body with our hands, hands crossed in front of us. And we spoke almost like at a funeral. And we apologized to this, to this creature that we had remade. And we, we apologized and we said, I'm sorry. In the hopes that he would forgive us for the atrocious way that we <laughs> murdered him the first time. And uh, then after that, we slowly and carefully dismantled the uh, body and disposed of the head properly. After that, it seemed like it seemed like we were cool with this spirit. There wasn't, there wasn't that much uh, haunting going on per se. Things seem to be all right now. Uh, after that, me and Gavin both concurred that we didn't feel scared, and we didn't feel like we had a looming threat over us anymore. There's always, there's still that presence though. Occasionally, sometimes the lights will still turn off when we pass them, and. Uh, just inexplicable mysteries will show up and it's it's hard not to assign them to a Bemnumim now, even though I think we're somewhat good with him. It's still just, there's still just a little subconscious fear that, you know, maybe he'll turn again or maybe we'll, we'll mess something up. Now, months after it all, um, three things that first, uh, the footage and the documents that we have of his first creation and his second creation and an everlasting fear of foam heads. Uh, thirdly, a story from a close friendship. What lies beneath a story of tall monsters and nightmares is an adventure between friends a journey through fear and laughter, and a four-page writing to reminisce. This adventure might have scarred me, but I wasn't alone. And I always had Gavin there with me. I look back on it now with joy and not fear because of that fact. Missing again? <laughs> Just learning about this now, talking to my friend here. We didn't dispose of the head. We placed it on Gavin's shelf and it went missing. Again. Thank you for watching. Thank you for enjoying this documentary. Um, I appreciate it. Hi, Mrs. Glott. <laughs>
<laughs> oh, fantastic. Cutting.